Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so happy to gather to study your word, which is so amazing. And as we study the blue stone and learn the meaning of blue and learn the spiritual meaning of stone and know who you are, may you deepen our relationship with you as we know from our minds the knowledge of you. May we experience you in a more wholesome way that you may say you know us and we who say we know you will also follow you wherever you go whatever you ask us to do in Jesus name we pray amen okay today's is on the blue stone part two <laughs> Welcome to Angels in the Glen. This is part two of the Blue Stone. And in the last part, you saw we started to lay the framework, the foundation in terms of understanding the parallel between the Exodus experience. God brings his people out of Egypt, brings them through the Red Sea, and he brings them to his holy habitation, his holy mountain. We saw that it matched the pattern of the sanctuary from the bronze altar to the priest, the laver of water where the priest would wash to the holy place and most holy place where God dwells above the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant, which the Ten Commandments were in. So let's do a quick review of that because I want to make sure we're synced up. If you just jumped in and joined us, great. We'll do a quick review and we'll keep moving along in this study. So Moses' sanctuary pattern layout. You see on the screen, Passover baptized through the Red Sea, brings them to God's holy mountain, and God says it's consecrated, it's set apart, the, whole, the mountain's holy. And God instructs Moses, chapter 25, verse 8, Exodus 25, verse 8, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them according to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. We saw last time multiple types of temples or sanctuaries in the Bible. There's seven exact to be distinct on the screen. Moses' sanctuary, Solomon's temple, Jesus Christ, the church, our bodies, the heavenly temple, God and the Lamb. This is all review. You all know this real good. Just a quick review. Hebrews 9 points out that this more perfect tabernacle in heaven, Christ enters a more perfect tabernacle in heaven, not made with hands, to say not of this creation. Okay, so there's a heavenly sanctuary, a heavenly temple that exists. In fact, Hebrews 8 would even say this. The main point is what you said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. That's why God would say in verse 5, God says, when he was about to erect the tabernacle to Moses, see that you make all things according to the pattern which was showing you on the mountain. See, God showed him a pattern of the sanctuary, of the true tabernacle in heaven, and he says, build it according to that pattern. Okay, now it's not an exact replica, but it's a pattern. Okay, and so through that understanding, that pattern of that sanctuary, we understand greater truths about God, his nature, his kingdom, and the true tabernacle in heaven. And here's a layout of it right here. Layout, I've got it laid out towards the east. Bronze altar, bronze laver. Then you've got the tabernacle itself, the holy place and the most holy place. The covering cherubim, God's Shekinah glory above the cherubim, God's presence. And then below the mercy seat and the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant. So now we see a comparison between the two. The Passover would match the bronze altar. The Red Sea where they were baptized through the water. Priests are washing. That's where they're consecrated, made holy. Then we see God's dwelling place. Again, it was concentrated, made holy, set apart. And you have the holy place and the most holy place where God dwells. Exactly the same pattern. Now we're going to go in even deeper. Look at this. I just want to underscore this in Exodus 19, verses 1 through 4. Just pick it up in the last verse, since we covered this last time. Verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to, to who? To myself. Okay, God is a personal God. He's bringing them to his holy mountain, to himself. Let's keep going through the storyline. I want you to see how things are unfolding over the next 
couple of chapters because I just want you to get a big picture overview of what's going on. Chapter 19, verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. And then in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3, this is where God speaks to Moses and the children of Israel and speaks to them his Ten Commandments. Look how he starts off speaking the Ten Commandments. Verse 1, Exodus 20, then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Right there, that's the first commandment. Okay, but look how he opens this up. I mean, think about this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. He brings them out of bondage, and then he establishes his law. This is a very significant thing. He brings them to himself and establishes his law. I'm not going to go through the rest of the nine, but I just want you to get the big picture of what's going on here. He speaks those Ten Commandments. Now, he's going to ask Moses to come up to him on the mountain. Pick it up in Exodus 24, verses 1 and 2. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nehemiah and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Notice that. Worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Talked about that. God is setting, it's sanctified. It's 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 holy, it's set apart. He's he's giving them instructions on how to come up and 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 come to him. Now, I just want to establish one thing. Remember when Moses gets his commission from God, he's on Mount Horeb, he's at Mount Horeb, I should say, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and the burning bush is there. Remember that? And basically, God commissions him at the burning bush. And he says, well, the place where you are standing is holy ground. Remove your sandals because he's on Mount Horeb. He's at Mount Sinai. And God commissions him and he sends him to go to Egypt. Pick it up in Exodus 3, verses 1 and 2. I want you to see this pattern here. Now, Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There he is. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, this is Moses, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Now look what God says to him in verse 10. Therefore, come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. You see what's happening? God says, he commissions Moses at the burning bush, says, you're going to go bring my people out of Egypt. And this is the sign. You're going to worship me at this mountain. And now we've just gone through that. Now Moses is right there on the mountain. He's about, God's calling him up to the mountain. And pick it up in verse 3, Exodus 24, verse 3, because he's about to come up to him on the mountain. He's already given instructions. Moses is going to come near. The others are going to stay at a distance. Exodus 24, verse 3. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. I should pause here and say, you know, this is basically they're entering into a bilateral covenant with God. And I don't have time to go through this, the two covenants, the difference between the two, but we're, we're doing the bluestone study and Moses sprinkles the blood on them. But that's not the purpose of this study here. There's, the Bible is so rich with these things. I, I just got distracted because that's a really important study too. But here's this, verse four, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. I just want to underscore that. What does Moses do at the foot of the mountain? Moses builds an altar. He built an altar. All right. Watch what happens in verse nine. This is where it gets very interesting. If you have your Bible, go ahead and pull it out. 
If you don't, go ahead and look up at the screen. We're going to interact with these verses a little bit and underscore a couple of points. Exodus 24, verse 9. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now, pause right here. If we just focus on verse 11, he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. Okay, because why? Because they were the only ones allowed to go up to the Lord on the mountain. They were consecrated. They were set apart. And they eat and drank. So just take a note of that. But I want to focus in another part of this verse. Go back to that scripture verse again. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. I want to ask you this on the screen. What was under God's feet? If you look in your Bible, look in the scripture verses right there. What was under God's feet? I'll underline it for you. And under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Now, that's very interesting. Clear as the sky itself. Sapphire. What color is sapphire? Blue. Now you're wondering. Now you're making a connection. Why did we title this study the blue stone? Okay, what's under God's feet? Sapphire, clear as the sky itself. What color is the sky? That's right, blue. Now pick it up in verse 12. I want you to see this. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain, talking to Moses, and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. I just want to underscore a couple of things. I'm using the NASB. But I want to use another version because I really want to underscore this point. What's under God's feet? Look at the New King James Version up on the screen. And they saw the God of Israel, verse 10, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Saying a different, slightly differently, a paved work of sapphire stone, sapphire blue. It was like the very heavens, the heavens of the sky, blue. All right, that's under God's feet. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm just trying to underscore a point here. Let's take a look at another version of the Bible. I just want to make sure, just to make sure there's no distinction. Look at the Revised Standard Version. Pick it up in verse 10. What was under God's feet? Verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heavens for clearness. Okay, it seems to me these versions are all saying the same thing. There's a pavement of sapphire stone. That's what's under God's feet. Verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain, wait there, and I will give you this tables of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. Here's the point. I want to show you the King James Version, one last version, and then I'm going to show you the Hebrew. Take a look on the screen. Do you see how it says, in verse 10, they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, as it were, the body of heaven in clearness. Now jump down to verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayst teach them. Now in the Hebrew, Exodus 24, verse 12, tables of the stone specifically pulling out that participle, the, tables of the stone. Now you might say, well, tables of the stone, which stone is he talking about? In the context and on the screen, there's only one stone that he's talking about in the entire context of the chapter 24, and that is the paved work of sapphire stone that's under his feet. Amazing truth that we're about to discover. Look at on your screen, I want, I want to unpack this. Do you see on the screen, you see God's holy mountain? It's set apart. It's holy. Remove your sandals from your feet. It's holy. Look at this. Moses experienced the burning bush in Exodus 3.1. Moses in 24 verse 4 sets up that altar. And in Exodus 24 verses 9 to 12, they ate and drank. And then God says to them, come up to me on the mountain. And that's where they see that sapphire stone beneath his feet 
And if it's beneath his feet, that means God is standing above the sapphire stone. So I've placed God right above that sapphire stone. You see, our traditional understanding of the Ten Commandments have been that they were a gray, brown, or granite type of a stone. But the Bible is teaching something very differently. The Bible is teaching that the Ten Commandments were taken out of that blue sapphire stone under the feet of God. It says it right there in Exodus 12, 24, verse 12. I'll give you the tablets. I'll give you tables of the stone, tables that were come from that pavement of sapphire that I'm standing on. So on the screen, you see there, our traditional understanding is gray, granite, brown. Okay, we have to be careful when we even watch movies about Bible things. They can mislead us. We have to stay in the Bible and see what the Bible actually says. The scriptural understanding, the biblical understanding, is that the Ten Commandments were made out of blue sapphire stone. Whoa, amazing. When, it's some, when I was taught this lesson for the first time, I was like, this is unbelievable. But here's the thing. We're going to go into much deeper. Blue is just the thread that we're going to pull on here. Because I was curious. I did a little research. I don't know if you've heard of Legends of the Jews by Lewis Ginsburg. I went back to his book and I was just curious, did, did the Legends of the Jews even record anything like this in their writings? Now, again, I'm going by the Bible. All right, Your Bible would have said just what you read it, the different versions. The tables of stone, they were blue sapphire stone. I'm reading my Bible, but I was just curious. I was just curious. Look on the screen. Here's the Legends of the Jews, volume three, Lewis Ginsburg, page 118. Moses departed from the heavens with the two tables on which the Ten Commandments were engraved and were made of sapphire-like stone. <laughs> now, when I read that, I was like, amazing. In the legends of the Jews, they already had this recorded. I wasn't even studying my Bible for all it's worth. The answer was right here in my Bible, that God's Ten Commandments were made out of blue sapphire stone. Amazing truth. You know what I did this? I was just curious. I kept reading Lewis Ginsburg, and I was just curious to see if he said anything more about these stone tablets. And he does. Actually, back on page 49, Legend of the Jews, up on the screen, ancient Jewish, Jewish scholars state that the sapphire employed for the tables was taken from the throne of glory. Whoa, I was really intrigued when I read that. The stone tablets came from God's throne? That's interesting. Hold on to that just for a minute. Put that off on the side. I'm going to come back to it. We're going to take a look and what the, see what the Bible says about God's throne. Let's take a look at what the Bible says, because I don't want to read legends. That was just a pointer. Let's keep going right now. Look at this. I want you to see this pattern, because this, this is setting the stage for a greater point. Pick it up. Exodus 24, verse 13. So Moses arose with Joshua, his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Continuing on where we left off. Moses went up to the mountain of God, but to the elders, he said, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, let him approach them. Then Moses went up to the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top, on the mountaintop. Verse 18, Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And you see what happens is, over the next few chapters, from chapters 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, God speaks to Moses, and he establishes the pattern of the sanctuary. We're not going to go through all those details. Just want you to see Moses is on the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights. Exodus 31, verse 18, setting the stage. He's on the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights. This is what God says to him. Verse 18, when he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Who wrote it? God wrote it with his own finger. Now, let's take a look and see and discover some amazing truths about God's throne. I was curious, does the Bible teach that God's throne was made out of blue sapphire stone? Absolutely. 
go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees this vision of a wheel within a wheel and the cloud and the glory and everything. And, and I'm not going to go through that vision right now. All I want you to do is see the end part of the vision. Pick it up in Ezekiel 126. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of a throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Now, that's amazing. Ezekiel sees this vision. Here's this throne, sapphire stone, appears as a throne. Blue, sapphire throne. Amazing. In fact, that's the King James Version. Let me show you what it says in the NASB, Ezekiel 126, same verse. Now, above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that, which resembled a throne, high up was the figure with the appearance of a man. Now, that man would be Jesus Christ. It's amazing here. We see God's throne made out of sapphire stone. In the NASB, it calls it lapis lazuli. In fact, I want to show you some lapis lazuli right here. In fact, my wife was in Canada. Honey, were you in uh, Canada last year or the year before? Last year. She was in Canada. She saw this. She called me up. She says, I found some lapis lazuli. It's, it was from Afghanistan. She picked it up. I don't know if you can see that. It's a beautiful stone. Look at, look at that. It's a, it's a deep, dark blue. You can see some granite gray in, this, in the sides right here. And you can see speckles of gold. That's not real gold, but it looks like it's gold. But look at the brilliant blue right here. Lapis lazuli. And I think this, this cost, how much did this cost, honey? Like $80? Yeah. $80 just for, I don't know, this is like maybe a half a pound or so. But um, just to, think about this. I mean, this is real stone. Just to get your... Just to wrap your head around this, God's throne, like sapphire stone, like lapis lazuli in appearance, I would have never have thought that God's throne was made out of sapphire stone, let alone 10 commandments, the tables of stone were carved out of blue sapphire stone, out of this, this stone right here. This is the stone that Moses had, the 10 commandments were on this stone. That's amazing. I'm just going to set this right here. I'm just amazed about this study right here. Let's keep going. There's another verse in the scriptures that I want to point out that point out that God's throne was made out of sapphire stone. Just pick it up in Ezekiel 10 verse 1. This is King James Version. Then I looked and behold in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. There you have it right there. Sapphire, stone, throne, all tightly coupled right there. Now, let me ask you this. Is God's throne temporary or is it enduring? Of course, it's enduring. It's everlasting. In Hebrews 1.8, it says this. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. I, I love reading scriptures like this, the reassuringness of the fact and the reality of the truth that God's throne is established forever, forever. We don't need to worry about another kingdom overtaking it. God's kingdom is established when he returns that second time. Now, some people say, wait a second, wait a second, John. Doesn't it say, isn't there talk about a great white throne judgment? Isn't, isn't there a scripture in the, in the Bible? I say, yes. But take a look on the screen. I want to unpack this for you. In Revelation 21, verse 11, it says this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. You see right there, a white throne. So what's going on here? Is it white or is it blue? Well, remember, if you take a look at the word white, it comes from the Greek word leukos, which means light, bright, or brilliant. Now, why the translators translated that white, I'm not sure. But think about this, leukos. Light, bright, or brilliant. I want to give you another scripture verse that would demonstrate that God's throne is light, bright, and brilliant, and not necessarily white. Take a look at Daniel 7, verse 9. I kept looking until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took a seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Think about that. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing out and coming out from before him. Whoa, think about this. God's throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels, wow, God has 
wheels on his throne? Its wheels were what? A burning fire? A river of fire is coming out from before him? Flowing out from before him? I would have never have thought that God's throne was burning fire. That's not the image that we naturally think when we don't study the Bible. Because if you would have came up to me and said, uh, what's God's throne like? I would have probably imagined something like, and, and would have said, I probably did say, oh, probably gold or maybe bright white or something like that, maybe glorious. What's the Bible teaching us? No, Bible's teaching us throne, blue sapphire stone, bright, brilliant, fire. Now, what's the color of fire? Typically, we associate fire with orange and red and maybe even a little bit of yellow. But what if you crank up that heat a little bit? What color is it? Yeah, it's blue. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Here's the other thing I want to point out. Do you see on that scripture verse right there? Back to that verse, verse nine. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. Its wheels were a burning fire. You mean God sits on, look at there on the screen there, Yahweh's in thrones, fourth century BC Jewish coin. Shows Yahweh sitting on his throne with wheels. It's a chariot. You see, God doesn't sit in a stationary throne. He sits on something that is movable. In some cases, some people may say it's a hot rod. It is a sports car moving across the universe. Now, I want you to just hang that in your mind as we continue this study. Because who is in the pillar of cloud, of fire, and uh, uh, with the sons of Israel? Who's in it? The Lord is with them, and it's moving. Makes sense? Chariot moving? God's throne is with him. He sits on his throne. Very, very interesting. Okay, let's keep going. I just wanted to point this other scripture out. First Chronicles 28, verse 18. It's talking about how the model uh, for the covenant, the model of the chariot, even the cherubim that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. We see the ch words chariot right there. Wow, chariot, that, that the ark of the covenant, the, God's throne is a chariot. I mean, chariot evokes power, authority, speed, all these things. That's what God sits upon. Now let's keep going. Now let's compare this. Up on the screen, I want you to see a comparison now of the Exodus experience with the sanctuary. Now look at that. Bronze altar associated with the Passover. You see that right there. You see bronze labor with the priest wash with the Red Sea. Now we go to the holy place and most holy place and the God's dwelling place on the mountain. Let me ask you something. Look at the bottom where God's dwelling place is on the mountain. Do you see the burning bush right there? Yes, of course, you see the burning bush. Move your eyes up to the holy place. Is there anything in the holy place that continually burns? If your knowledge of, if you don't know, it's the lampstand. That's right, the lampstand would continually burn. The seven, the seven uh, lights uh, on the lampstand would continually burn. Look back down on that mountain image. Moses builds an altar. Is there an altar in the holy place? Of course there's an altar, the altar of incense. Wow, amazing. What does Moses and the elders of Israel experience on the mountain? They ate and drank with the Lord. Wow, very interesting. Is there anything associated with food in the holy place? You got it. Table of showbread right there. Now, come back to me here. Think about this. Moses is told to come up to God on the mountain. You, Moses, you come near, and I will give you tables of the stone written for the instruction, the law and the commandments, statutes, so you can instruct them. So he goes further up on the mountain, back to the screen. Look at this, look at the look at the layout of the sanctuary. What happens? You move from the holy place into the most holy place into God's presence, right? So now you see God's presence above the cherubim, above the mercy seat, and below the mercy seat is the Ark of the Covenant, and inside the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. That means Ten Commandments, blue, sapphire, stone. Perfect match right there on the screen. Amazing truth. You see that? I'm blown away by this great truth that God's throne is made of blue sapphire stone. His Ten Commandments are made of blue sapphire stone, like lapis lazuli in appearance. That's that stone right there. Now, I have to ask you this question. Would the children of Israel have known that the Ten Commandments were made out of blue sapphire stone? 
That's a reasonable question. Would they have known? I would submit that they absolutely 100% knew that they were blue sapphire stone. Take a look at Numbers 15, verse 37. The Lord spoke also to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corner of their garments throughout their generations and that they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. Whoa, a cord of what color? Blue, not surprising. Verse 39, it shall be a tassel for you to look at and to remember all the commandments of the Lord. Wow, look at it. Blue, all the commandments of the Lord, so as to do them and not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you played the harlot, so that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. That's the same way he starts out saying the Ten Commandments, right? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Remember to do all the commandments of the Lord. Think about this. What he said, he says, put a cord of blue, put a cord of blue on your garments. And can you imagine that? I wear a cord of blue. You wear a cord of blue. We're walking around doing our daily work. We're farming. We're doing our work. We're carpenters, whatever we're doing. And we look and we see the cords of blue on everybody's clothing. We look on our own clothes. We see a cord of blue. And what is it we what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to what? Remember to do all the commandments, all of them, all 10, be obedient. God brought us out of Egypt. He's called us to be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom holy to himself. And don't play the harlot. Don't follow after your own eyes. Don't do your own thing. Don't worship other idols. Don't bow down to them. Don't do that. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's really the, the law. I mean, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those 10 are summarized in those two commandments right there. It's a law of love. Remember to do them. Amazing right there. Let's keep going. A couple other verses, and we'll wrap this particular study up. Psalms 97, verse 2. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Think about that. Think about that. Righteousness doing right justice right justice is the 10 commandments and what are they they're the foundation of his throne that's exactly where the 10 commandments are the 10 commandments are part of the throne of god the foundation where he sits above them the foundation of his throne this is this is the anchoring moral law for the universe remember pattern of the earthly sanctuary is the pattern in the heavenly sanctuary. We're gaining a greater understanding of the moral law, not only for the earth, but for the entire universe and all of God's creation. Psalms 89, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. It's talking about the Ten Commandments. Loving kindness and truth. The moral law is truth, loving kindness, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a law of love, and it's the foundation of God's government. A couple more things here. You're saying blue, interesting, but Ten Commandments are done away with. They're done. We're, we're, we don't live under the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. Hold with me right here. Hold with me. Take a look on the screen. I want to show you two scriptures. Verse 18, Exodus 31, verse 18. When he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tables of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Okay? Only God wrote the that. He did not entrust Moses to write this. Okay? No one other than God himself would write it with his own finger. Okay? Moses, you're not to write this. I'm to write it. In fact, think about this. Let's step back. Moses, or the children of Israel with Moses are at Mount Sinai, and God speaks the Ten Commandments to them. He speaks those words to him, and later Moses would, would record it in the Bible, in, in, in Exodus, in, in, in the Torah, but God writes the Ten Commandments himself on tables of stone. Now you're saying, well, wouldn't the second, didn't that first set of tables of stone get broken? Yes, they were. 
We're going to talk about that in the next lesson. But right now, take a look on the screen. You'll see Exodus 34, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you shattered. And we'll address that in next lesson. But I just want to say this. God writes them himself both times. Okay, doesn't entrust it to anyone else. Now, those of you who say, well, we're under the new covenant. What do we have to do with the old covenant? What does this have to do with us now? Well, I'm glad you brought that point up. Let's take a look at Jeremiah verse 31. Uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. You kind of saw we did a little bit of study. This is all that the Lord was, was all that the Lord has said we will do. And they didn't do it. Okay, they broke that covenant. Keep reading verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wow, look at that. We transition old to new covenant. This is the new covenant. God would, instead of writing it on tables of stone, he would write it on the tables of our heart. In fact, pick it up in Hebrews 8 verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hebrews 10, verse 15, one more scripture verse. We're going to unpack a great truth right here in a second. And the Holy Spirit, Hebrews 10, verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, I will write them. Important to understand mind. We'll study the more about that in Revelation 13. I will put my laws upon their hearts and on their minds. I will write them. And he says then, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. One question I have to ask you this is, how does God actually write his law on our hearts? That's, that's a reasonable question. How would he do that? I mean, he wrote with his own finger the commandments on tables of stone. That's clear multiple times in the Old Testament. How does he establish the new covenant? How does he write the commandments on the, our hearts? I want to compare scripture with scripture so you can really understand what's going on here. And there's a story that Jesus interacts with the Pharisees and they say, because he casts out demons by Beelzebub. And Jesus says, you know, if I cast out how kingdom divided against itself can't stand. I want, I want you to pick up that storyline in Matthew 12, and I just want to read through it. I want to make a significant point, and we'll bring this study to a close. Matthew 12, verse 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and said, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Watch what happens next. Verse 25. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided itself will not stand. Verse 26. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If by Beelzebub, if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. Verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That last verse I want to focus in. I want to focus in very closely. Look up on the screen. I've got it in big letters. The last verse, Matthew 12, 28, right there. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, we know the gospels tell the stories of these events in slightly different ways. 
So I want to go over and see exactly what's said in Luke chapter 11 about the same story. I'm not going to read the whole storyline to you. I just want to focus in on the key verse here. See it up on the screen. Verse 20, but if Jesus speaking, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Wow. Now that's very interesting. First, he casts out demons by the spirit of God. And then in Luke, it records it slightly differently, same storyline. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Wow. Do you see that spirit of God, finger of God, same thing, same thing. So now we have to ask ourselves, how does God write his law upon our hearts? He doesn't entrust anyone to write it. He doesn't entrust you to write it. It's not through you. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, finger of God, he writes his law upon your hearts. Amazing, amazing truths right there. Because we can't walk in obedience without the Holy Spirit. God has to write, if you will, software code on our hearts. We have to choose to follow it. We have to choose. He's, he's, he gives us a free will, free choice. He says, if you want to walk in obedience, you can. I want to walk in obedience. I don't know about you. And keep all the commands of God, not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I want to keep all of them because it's a law of love. Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul, soul and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. God writes it on our hearts. Look at this one last scripture verse here. 2 Corinthians 3, verse, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. Paul speaking, you are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves but our ad adequacy is from God. That's a really important point to underscore. We are not adequate in ourselves. It's not about our strength and our power, our might, our willpower to do and obey. We are adequate because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Spirit of Christ lives in us. Okay, we were crucified and died with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives within me and lives within you to live a holy and obedient life. Amazing scriptures here. Verse six who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So here we know the rock, the law is the source of our moral certainty. There's no question about it. There's no changing right here. That is the beginnings of the blue stone. Now I want to point this out to you. Here's the key thing. Blue is interesting, but it's not the main thing. It's just set the stage for us to allow us to go deeper into much greater truth. And next time we're going to have, we're going to discover some amazing deeper truths because blue now fades away a bit. And we focus in on this rock that followed them. And this rock was Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we just thank you that your moral law Lord, when we accept Christ as our Savior, your Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, and you write upon the tables of our heart your Ten Commandments, your commandments that are not about just keeping rules and regulations, but it's about a loving relationship with you and with others. Your moral law of the universe is a law of love, and we thank you for it, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Keep us in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, any reactions from you? <laughs> any comments? Uh, Rosanna? Yes, GT. Uh, no, just, uh, just to get my understanding. NASB means what? New American Standard Bible. New American Standard Bible. Bible. Thank you. Okay. All right, yesterday you all were concerned about Bibles being um, distorted, you know, because we were studying Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. And we saw that the word people of the prince was replaced by the word ruler. Okay, so 
uh, just like the mark of the beast has two compartments. You have to know what is the beast before you know what is the mark. So you know, we need to know that it's people of the prince and the prince is the Messiah. Not just the uh, anointed one, but it has, um, it, it actually says Messiah, the prince. But then it, in, in those verses, they actually uh, twisted it to the anointed one instead of saying Messiah, the prince, then now people of the prince, they take away the prince and make it the people of the prince becomes just a ruler. So now we have not just um, people of the prince, the mark of the beast, we have seal of the living God, which uh, we, we, we understand it to be the Sabbath. And you have the, now we have tables of the stone. Two compartments again, tables of the stone and we talk about that blue stone that lapis lazuli and how did god make it sure that those 10 commandments are really important easy question okay each one can give me a certain aspect okay someone like to get the ball rolling how did God make sure that those Ten Commandments are really special? Shushin, you just give me one. Thank you. <laughs> written by his own finger. Okay, written by his own finger. Thank you. Next one. How did God make those Ten Commandments special? Only Shushin knows the answer. Okay, Listen. Esther. The table is blue color. Ah, why, why, why choose blue? Why not some other colors? God's color. God's color. Okay, look around you. Um, if you're in a house, of course you don't see blue, right? But when God made Adam and Eve, where do they see the blue? Good, good, Esther. Uh, your answer is good. The like sky. The sky. Uh huh. And, and and is the sky only a little bit? The sky is very broad. It's very vast. Very it's vast. very vast. I like your word. Okay, Vivian. Vast, vast. You can't miss blue. If you just look up, you see the sky. You can't miss blue, right? And when you see blue, it has a reminder. What does it remind you of? Royal uh, Loyalty. Loyalty, okay? It reminds you of what we're studying today, which is the sapphire stone. The sapphire stone, which is which under his feet. Oh, okay, you're <laughs> giving me a lot of things now. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you, Vivian. So now we have um, the blue, which is vast, written in a finger, is under his feet, made of special stone, eh? the fire. And when it is under his feet, it is his throne, right? And when you sit on the throne, it is like a foundation, correct? When we sit on a throne, um, sometimes, you know, some people, uh, 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 let's say bosses or what, huh? And if they don't sit on their boss's chair properly, sometimes my mother say that chair, um, going to lose that chair, you know? You know what I'm saying? And those of you uh, who, who are familiar with this phrase, yeah, <laughs> mm. <laughs> the chair not, not firm already, you know, it's going to lose that, that, that position, okay? God's throne has a foundation. That is his position, Okay. His authority. His authority. His government. What else? All right. So very good. All these answers are very good. And it is where he write his Ten Commandments. So you see, the Ten Commandments of God, they are so clearly distinct from any of the other things that are written in the Bible. Even the Bible is written by man, right? But the Ten Commandments 
is differentiated by it being specially written by God's own finger, even after Moses threw it down and broke it because the people broke like broke broke the covenant. You know, there is a bilateral covenant. All that the Lord said we will do, but they broke it by building the golden calf. So Moses threw the covenant, threw the Ten Commandments, and when God had it written again, it was again with his own finger. And we learn that in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, that finger of God it is, is his spirit that writes it in our hearts. So how can we say, oh, we just love God, love man, and we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments, especially the Fourth Commandment is done away with. How can we say we love God when we remove his throne his position, his authority, his government. Who is it who wants to do that, actually? Who is it that all along wants to be like God and take away God's position? Who is it who tells Jesus? Lucifer. Yes. Huh? Satan tells Jesus, bow down and worship me. All these things will I give you if you will bow down and worship me. What a lie. Right? That's what he will tell his worshippers also, right? There is a Satan temple in America, right? You bow down and worship him, he may give you riches for a while, but so many of those people end up what? Taking drugs, committing suicide, and so forth. Satan can promise us things, but he is a bad master. So let us not be deceived into thinking like Satan does in removing the law of God. Even one of them, in James 2.10, it tells you, if you fall in one law, it's actually all guilty already, guilty of all of it. So it is so important for us to understand this correctly. We cannot like cut up the Bible and, and certain parts we want, certain parts we don't want. We have to see the whole Bible from Old Testament, New Testament and understand it. And today, what a beautiful lesson we have. The blue stone that deepens our understanding of God. The solid rock that we are to build our house on his Ten Commandments, you know, his foundation, the foundation of his throne, that we may be firmly grounded in him, the rock of ages. All right. Over to you all. Any questions? What I like about the Ten Commandments that the law, that the Lord actually personalize it and handwritten by him. It is so meaningful. I know the whole Bible is spirit and inspired, but this is really very personalized. He handwritten it for all of us. Amen. I just mm, thank yeah. the Lord for that, you know, so personalized. Amen. So it's, it's not like, wow, you know, I just want to have an experience with God. I want to have a relationship with God, but I don't want to keep his commandments, that kind of thing. You know, when I was a child, huh, you know, um, and when I heard that God wrote the commandments with his own finger, to me, it was like, wow. You know? And then now, oh, we, we missed one point. God also speak the Ten Commandments, right? He also speak. That's how he made it special, you know? He spoke to them personally and gave them the Ten Commandments. It's like, wow, what a God. But it also, wow, it must be very important. Now, I grew up in a Christian family. And so when I um, hear that as a child, imagine Israelites, Okay, you don't have to be an adult. But when you are a child even, and you hear that God spoke the Ten Commandments, wrote it with his own finger, won't your attention be fixed on it and say that must be really important? Right? 
Okay, your thoughts, please. Questions? It is very serious, I think, because uh, if God uh, take the time and the trouble to write it and to speak it out, this is really non-negotiable. Amen. My thought. Uh. You are right. This is only part two, there is a part three, and I hope that you all can share. If you find part one, part two meaningful to you, share it with your friends and invite them to come and join us next week for part three. Because part three is even deeper. It's like once you are in the right direction, you can grasp more deeply, okay? You can examine it further. Right? So that's where we are in right now. Israel was given the truth. They are supposed to give the truth to others. However, they kept it to themselves. And that's the sad part. Okay? So now as we discover this important truth, let's share it. And let us come back together next week to look deeper into it. It's beautiful and it's all about Jesus Christ. A lot of people think that, oh, you know, when you talk about the Lord, let's just have Jesus Christ. But next week, you'll find that the Lord is all about Jesus Christ. And in what way? You'll find out next week. Beautiful, beautiful meaning that is so, so, so clear and yet it's so special spiritual that we are amazed that you know god gives spiritual lessons to those people through those literal objects to teach them that they will not miss the spiritual lessons You all heard the phrase cast in stone, right? When something is cast in stone, it must be permanent. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be like, you know, cannot change already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And where is this tablets of stone kept? Any idea? In the ark. In the ark, you know. In the most holy place. And the ark is in the most holy place. And so the, the, the very stone with the Ten Commandments is inside the ark, which is inside the most holy place, which is in the temple, which is among is which is which is in Jerusalem, which is among you know in, in, in Israel. So it's really, really, really in the heart of the whole thing, the heart of God. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll see the Fourth Commandment is also in the heart of the Ten Commandments. I mean, the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath. Yeah, so you see the Ten Commandments, um, very special here. Okay, any thoughts? Um, questions? Doctor, are you talking? Please unmute yourself. Okay, if you are wondering why Kokto and I, we are not together, it's because um, Kokto has been exposed to uh, somebody with COVID and so we are uh, in different room right now. <laughs> so uh, Kokto, can you please unmute yourself? I think you're saying something.
Okay, I was saying, I want to read Revelation 7, verse 3. It has Sorry? to be, it has to do with... Uh, can, can you repeat? Because there was a lot of noise around the phone. I want to read Revelation 7, verse 3. It is about the four angels letting, wanting to let go, preparing to let go the four winds of strife. And another angel came from the east and said, ho, ho, ho. Don't let go until we seal the servants of God. Okay. So this angel from the east is saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we've sealed the servants of a God in their foreheads. Okay. So there was a seal that was to be put on the servants of God. 144,000, right? And then if you go to Revelation 14, you will see 14 verse 1, that this, uh, the ones that were sealed were the 12 tribes of Israel. And where were they sealed? On their foreheads with what? Verse 14, one says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the mount of Zion with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So what were they sealed with? The name of God. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, are we expecting uh, Yahweh, you know, YHWH on the forehead? Or are we expecting or to conclude that it is the law written in our hearts. And how do we have confidence to say, no, it's not YHWH, Yahweh written on the forehead. That's too literal. But that it is a law written in the hearts. How do we know that of the 144,000? Well, if you go down, verse, uh, Revelations 14, verse 12, you will see that. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God mm -hmm. and the faith of Jesus. So the law is written, yes, in the foreheads, but what it means is the law, no, the, the Father's name is written in the foreheads, but what it means is the law is written in their hearts. Verse 12 tells you exactly that. Okay? Now, what is their first message to the world? What this 144,000, which has the law written in their hearts, what is their first message to the world? Okay, now you will find that in verse 7, Revelations 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's the fourth commandment. And it points to who? The creator God. The one who wrote with his finger. Now, all this is made possible only because of verse 12, which says, and, and these people, the 144,000, they have the faith of Jesus. That's verse 12. So it's a matter of faith. Mm -hmm. So now I hope you can see that the 144,000, because they have the faith of Jesus, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. It applies to us Christians. You know what God is giving us? He's giving us his name. He's writing it in our hearts. And when we say, yes, I have a relationship with God. And I, I, I love man and I love God. But I, I think the law is all covenant. You know, it's such a disconnected thought. That it actually makes no meaning. It makes no sense if you know the Bible. Okay. So I, I hope that this putting this picture together uh, will help us understanding prophecy in relation to the blue stone.
Yeah, I really like the connection that you made just now. The father's name written in their foreheads. And just now we read also there's a text in the Old Testament that talks about putting the, the law, you know, in the frontlets of your, between your eyes. And that's the forehead, right? And here we have the commandments. So it's connected. And then they have the faith of Jesus. And we are told in verse um, uh, 4 of this same chapter, Revelation 14, 4, that they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So it's like we have the surname of God, you know, right? As Christians, we have the Christ name there. We follow the Lamb wherever we go. So we are supposed to have the faith of Jesus. We are not like working our way to heaven by keeping the law of God, it's not by works that anybody can be saved. It's by faith that we keep the law because we are saved, just like Israel was redeemed. And then they were given the law for them to keep. And the law is to remind them of God's creative and redemptive power. And it's like, we belong to God, you know, because we, he created us. And he redeemed us also. We doubly belong to him. Um, okay, this is, um, I want to share that. I think there is one song uh, where I used to sing in the church. Huh? I think it is in the book of Psalms 119 verse 11. Huh? Saying that I have hidden your word. Your word is God's law in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is a very beautiful uh, uh, song that we sing in church. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So God's law must be in our heart that is perpetually that we will not sin against him. It's written in our heart. Yes. So just a sharing only. Mm hmm and so you'll see that in that same chapter, Revelation 14, just now, the 144,000, they have no guile, right? So they do not sin against God because they have hidden the law of God in their hearts. But today, many people, many pastors, you can't, you can't stop sinning. You, 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 are, you, are, you have this sinful nature that um, just have to sin because we are sinful by nature. However, we are taught in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are to be a new creation, right? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Our characters should be changed. Our minds should be transformed by the renewal of our thoughts. We should be... We should be able through the grace of Christ which is sufficient for us overcome sin so that we can be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect so that we can be holy as our heavenly father is holy yes it could be a what you call um, progressive journey yes we, it doesn't mean that the moment we accept Christ we become perfect however we are to abide in him and have faith in him and allow him to sanctify us. And that's why the Sabbath is a sign of his sanctification. When we understand the Sabbath, we will actually claim God's power, the Holy Spirit's enabling us to overcome sin. Doctor, please unmute. Okay, at this stage, I want to read Hebrews 2.11. Okay, Hebrews 2.11. Now, we, we've all said we want a better and better and improving and growing relationship with Christ. 
and in relation to sanctification. Sanctification is that unity with God. Unity with God the Father through Christ. Verse 11, Hebrews 2, 11 says this. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Now, as we read this, remember the Sabbath is a sign of your sanctification. So who is speaking here about, you know, is, is, is the book of Hebrews about Jesus for both Christ who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. That's unity. It's the only true unity and the only true relationship between Christ and his people. Now, let's say there are 30, 40 people today. And what it says is that both Christ who sanctifies and the 40 people today are all, both are one. That's unity. And it's sanctified unity. For which cause, Christ is not ashamed to call them brethren. For which cause? In other words, Jesus came for that purpose. To be one with us. True sanctification. And he gave us a sign of his sanctification. The Sabbath. So we see now how the law is a spiritual matter. It was uh, in the Old Testament. It's way back there. It seemed to be so rigid and concrete and in stone. But no, it is such a spiritual matter that is flowing through all the texts of the Bible. And it is how we can become one with God. Right, through Christ. And I hope it pulls together this picture for us all. Yeah, I'd like to um, draw attention also to Psalms 19, which is a very favorite psalm of Cocteau. <laughs> Psalms 19 verse 7, and many people love this psalm as well. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul now sometimes we say we are converted already oh converted now we became a christian it tells us here is the law of god the perfect law of god that converts our soul you know it's like wow when we meditate on the law of god we realize our sin it is our sin that makes us realize our need for a savior it is our guilt that draws us to the cross for confession. But today, well, Christians try to do away with the law. Buddhists will say, uh, we're not guilty, you know, uh, we just need to do good to, to, to conquer the bad so that we have good karma and we don't believe in the law of God for sure. So you see that this phrase, the law of God is perfect, converting the soul, has been changed, has been diluted, has been abused. It says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So you see, Jesus asked in Revelation 3 for the church of Laodicea to buy eyes south that they may see, right? The commandments of God, they are pure. Huh? Now as we study the blue stone, when we see it, huh, our eyes will be enlightened. You know? It will be an eye opener. Our eyes will be like having eyes south, and our blindness will go away when the commandments of God are understood and embraced. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And we read just now, Revelation 14, 7, the first angel's message. Fear God and give him glory. The fear of the Lord is clean. It, it endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The judgments of the Lord 
is the Ten Commandments that, which the, 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 the people are judged by. And it is in the Ark of the Covenant, which is under the mercy seat in the most holy place of the tabernacle. So you see all these tied together. They are like jigsaw puzzles that have to be understood in order to see how well knitted together the word of God is. It's like eating, you know. I can't say I just eat this vegetable and this vegetable only has vitamin A. And this one only has um, protein. A lot of it has a number of nutrients. And so one verse like that has a number of things that can actually connect with other verses in the Bible. When we eat of the word of God, we get nourished and get all the nutrients that we need. We cannot just say, I want the New Testament. If not, we will be undernourished, you know. And when we are undernourished, we get sickness. And when we get sickness, we can die. In relation to Psalms 19, I want to draw your attention to verse 5. All right? Since we are talking about King David and his meditation. See, when he started meditation in Psalms 19, verse 5, he began to see the sun. He was meditating on the universe, you know. And he said, which, so let's go back to verse 4. Their line, he's talking about the, the, the universe, the heavens, huh? their line of the sun and the stars is gone through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them had he set a tabernacle for the sun. The tabernacle is like a, a, a tent, you know. So uh, King David sees this whole universe is like, under God's tabernacle, under God's uh, heaven, under God's tent, you know, for the sun. And then he says in verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run the race. So the focus is, oh, the sun is not the sun. It's a bridegroom. <laughs> it's a strong man. It's Mare. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, it's, it's Christ, a bridegroom. So. This whole Psalm 19 is set in the context of a wedding. Right? When, when do we find the context of a wedding in prophecy? Jesus is coming for his bride. Huh? We are the bride, Christian, right? And so then he began, King David began to meditate on the law, on the statutes, on judgment and so forth. And then what happens? These things, like Dr. Anna just said, the law is useful in the sense, in this sense also, that it makes sin more sinful. And as King David meditated, not just on the law, but in the context of Christ as the bridegroom. Now, this is a wedding. This is a wonderful thing. So he began to see a bridegroom, Christ, and his own involvement in the wedding. And then he meditated on law. And it caused him to sense his, well, is he pure? Is he ready for the wedding? And then what does he say? He said in verse 12, right? At verse 11, let's go to verse 11. Moreover, by them. What is this them? The law. <laughs> the statutes. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. See, by meditating on the law, and not only the law, but on a wedding with Christ coming, it opens his heart. He is asking himself, have I my deceitful heart hidden my faults? From myself, that I don't know myself well enough. Lord, you know, search me, tell me my faults. So he became trusting in the Lord, opening his heart, transparent to God. And then what did he say? Next, verse 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. 
then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. So from faults, he went to sins. You see what a, a, a combination of Christ and the law does to people? A correct combination. You see what a, com, a, the, a good combination of mare and shazon does to people? You see, that's why when we talk, talk about prophecy, it's not about doom and gloom. Because when we combine mare and shazon, it is combining the bridegroom with the, the law. And so he said, I don't want this. There's going to be a wedding, a great wedding. This is, this is not doom and gloom. <laughs> this is a wedding. This is what we all live for as Christians. So he said, I want to be upright. I want to be innocent. I don't want, I want to be innocent from any great transgression, from the great transgression. And so the last verse, he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So he's appealing to God. And only God can do this. Only God can sanctify. So he gets back to Hebrews 2.11. For both, he who sanctified and they who are sanctified. And for this cause, he came. That we may be called brethren. Now, brethren, <laughs> that was light. This is going to be brethren, bridegroom. That's what it's going to be. So the beauty of the law, the spirituality of the law, let's not, let's remember how important this is. So I hope that, you know, next week, um, the Bluestone Part 3 can even make this more, more uh, invigorating for us all, spiritually invigorating for us all. Yes, and I, I, I told you, right, that's Doctor's favourite psalm and he has really inspired us with it. And I have actually at one time memorised this psalm. And you know, when um, you memorise something, you actually think about it a lot more than if you just read it, okay? And as we are talking today about the blue stone, about the blue sky, let me start from verse 1 now and show you, just now we started from verse 4, all right? The heavens declare the glory of God. The blue, heavens, blue. <laughs> blue, blue. <laughs> blue, blue, my love is blue, right? Heavens declare the glory of God. And the glory of God is what? It's light. The glory of God shines forth. Whether blue or yellow or light, it's glorious. The firmament shows his handiwork. The firmament, the 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 um the air, right? Shh, everything around. Thank you, okay, my sister's going back. The expanse of the heaven show us his handiwork. Day unto day, day by day, uttereth speech. The the creation of God, the creation of God to us every day. The blue sky speaks to us every day. And the night also shows us knowledge. At night, we see the stars. It teaches us that when things are difficult, we look up and we claim the promises of God. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The creation of God tells us about God. Just now we talk about the rock, the blue stone. It tells us about Jesus Christ. We talk about the seed of the woman. It tells us about Jesus Christ. The woman talks about the bride. And here it talks about the son. The son is like a bridegroom. We talk about the tree being thrown into the water to make the bitterness sweet. The water became sweet because of the tree that represented the cross of Christ. You see, everything, there is no speech, nor language, where their voice is not heard. So we hear the voice of God through his creation. We hear the voice of God. We hear the voice of God 
through his creation, we hear the voice of God through the blue sky. The law of God is speaking to each and every one of us. All right? Shall we close with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your glory. The glory of God as in the blue sky, in your creation, in everything around us that speaks to us of your love. May we not resist today when we hear your voice. You say, let us not harden our hearts. Help us to unlearn what we have been taught wrongly and relearn and be humble enough to be at your feet learning. And you, Lord, may you put your law in our hearts that we may not sin against you. May you write your law within us that we may meditate on you, your law, which is perfect. And it is your name. And may you bring us back together next week as we study further the beauty once we understand these things. So we thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Just like to share this text, which everybody is familiar. John 14, 15 says that if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Thank you. So if we truly love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. Amen. All right. Shushin, you have something? Oh, no. I just want to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye to all of you. Have a blessed week. God thank loves you. Me. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Love, 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 man. Yes, that's still true. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Rachel.